Hey everyone, thank you so much for hitting that play button. This is the Dave Bullis Podcast, and uh, I'm Dave, but I'm sure you've already figured that out. Uh, before we get to today's episode, I just want to say thanks to everyone for continuing to reach out to me for the trailer project I'm hoping to shoot this summer. Uh, you know, this whole process reminds me of why making anything, a feature film, a trailer, you know, a short film, it takes so long because you keep hitting delay after roadblock after roadblock. Um, so so the, the secret is you just have to keep pushing through. And perseverance is the key, uh, as it is to many things in life, is just perseverance and not to sort of get distracted or give up and quit. Um, things take longer than they should. Um, it's just it's a natural order of things. Um, unfortunately, with, with, with what we do, we just because things happen in life um, and you, you pull in a million different directions. And um, so, again, thank you, everyone, for all the continued support. And uh, I'm going to continue to do this. Um, nothing's going to stop me from making this thing. And uh, be, just because I want to get out there and be creative again and start getting back and doing this. I mean, it's been far, far too long. And some of you who've reached out to me in general, you know, you've mentioned that you're in the same position where you, you used to make stuff. And then all of a sudden, you know, 5, 10, 15 years have gone by and uh, you haven't made anything or, or you never got around to making your first thing. Just because, you know, it happens, man. Life happens. Um, so that's the importance of setting a goal and sticking to it and just persevering no matter what. Um, just a friendly reminder to everybody, if this is your first time listening or if you're a continued listener, um, all the pre-show notes uh, are at DaveBullis.com, and the show notes are right there as well. The pre-show notes are loaded with a ton of free stuff, so it's all about just, you know, I'm not trying to get you to, to, to buy <laughs> buy a course that I'm selling or anything like that. I have nothing to sell. Uh, literally, and the only thing I ask you is to, if you're going to shop on Amazon, and by the way, I want to give a shout out to Jake. I'm going to butcher your last name here, Jake. I think it's Stetler. Uh, for using my Amazon link to buy props for his movie. I mean, see, that's the key part of it. I mean, I, I have all these links up here, and they're all affiliate links, and that I just make money when, when you purchase things on Amazon. So if, if anyone is out there thinking about you know buying props for their movie or what have you through the Amazon link, um, please let me know so I can give you a shout-out, and I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. Uh, so without further ado, on this week's episode of the Dave Bulls Podcast, my next guest is back for a third time he is the machine behind indie film Hustle and the director of the new feature film On the Corner of Ego and Desire, which he actually shot at the Sundance Film Festival, completely guerrilla style. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about his day schedule because I want to ask him how he gets so much done every day. Um, we're going to go into people who remind us of the characters in his film when they get a monochrome of success or even when a potential of success that just goes right to their head. This is episode 217 with guest Alex Ferrari. You're listening to the Dave Bullis Podcast. Hey, brother, thank you for having me back, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is what, your third time back? I think it – is it my third time on the show? It, or is it, yeah. I think it's, it's the, our second or third. At least, yeah, it's around there. I've been back a few times, so thank you. It, it, it's kind of like SNL. You, you're going to get a <laughs> – after, after five, I'm going to give you a jacket. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Thanks for having me, man. No, no, always a pleasure, Alex. Uh, you know, you and I – um, both both do similar things, although you're just a lot more successful at it than I am. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, you know, we both have a podcast. We both do film stuff. Uh, we both talk to a lot of interesting people. Hell, we even have a lot of guest crossover. You know, sometimes I see them on your show, or 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 vice versa. So it's oh, you know... I'm poaching. I'm poaching from you all the time, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and you know you have the perfect way in too. You go, hey, listen, you've been on the Dave Bullis podcast. If you want to come onto a real podcast <laughs> that a that actually has a good reach and actually you know seems well produced, then you come on over here. And <laughs> and they're like, well, we're sold. I mean, obviously you're you're into podcasting, so I don't understand why you're not on my. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> You 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 talk badly about your show, sir. But you actually have one of the best podcasts on filmmaking on iTunes. It really is. And I was a fan before we met you, uh, before I met you. So uh, you 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 talk you talk lowly about your podcast, but it is fantastic, sir. So keep your head up high, sir. 
Oh, thank you, thank you. I I, I will. Um, and for for and I appreciate that, Alex. You know, for everyone listening, uh, here's a funny story for you. you know, we we were, Alex and I were going to do this podcast about two weeks ago. Yes. And literally, as we were about to start recording, my power just cuts off like, and um. I go, "There's no way this is happening." My my <laughs> so my laptop died earlier earlier that day. Where literally I couldn't use anything. Then I finally get the other laptop going, and then the power goes out, and I have nothing. I have no internet, nothing to record this. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, you know, if, if I did tell somebody, if you put that into a sitcom, no one would believe it. Everyone would go, hey, that's so too far fetched. Who whose life really that has all that stuff going on? Did you bring a tiki god back from Hawaii or something? Are you cursed? <laughs> <laughs> my, are you my, like the Brady Bunch? I mean, seriously. <laughs> my my podcast is built on an ancient Indian burial ground. Obviously, obviously, and it's uh, and then uh, you'll have twin little girls uh, with blood flowing through the from the walls, <laughs> like the Shining suit. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because my dad is actually a good part Cherokee Native American. Oh and, wow! Yeah, yeah, and and if you look at him and then look at me, you're like, you're like this guy's your dad. And I said, sadly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> too too many blood tests have confirmed that to be the truth. So uh, I guess I have to say yes. But uh, but no, yeah, like he he. If you look at him and look at me, like we look nothing alike, not even in the slightest. Well, I I I, I only know you from your cartoon, sir. <laughs> Trust me, the cartoon look makes me look actually look good I, I, in person. <laughs> People, people, whenever I meet people in person, when they ever they hear me on a podcast or whatever, and I meet them in person, there's always that look of disappointment in their eyes. And I'm just like, I'm, just oh, like, I'm always, I'm just always concerned about all those books that are right behind you right now that are going to fall and crush you one day. I, I, I wasn't going to tell you this, but the other day, a, <laughs> sta- a, a, a stack fell down, <laughs> and I, and and I shit you not, the the stack fell down. And then the blinds to my one window, they collapsed as well. Oh, my God. Why wasn't that on video? I have no idea because every time we've ever seen you on uh, – anytime you know, we ever got on uh, Skype, we'd always go, dude, you're going to die soon, dude. You're going to die by book. You're going to die by book and by the ultimate warrior that's sitting right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> I can just imagine the coroner's report being like, yep, they, they, he, he, you know, he has a big stogie in his mouth. He's like, another book death, huh? <laughs> another book death. <laughs> the great Gatsby got him. <laughs> <laughs> this is the fifth one I've seen this week. Everyone listening going, why did I tune into this episode? What's oh, yeah, going- absolutely. <laughs> they're, they're just like, why do I keep listening to this guy? Uh, they're like, <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> Meaning me, not you, Alex. Uh, yes, but... I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, Alex. Uh, you know, you and I, or you were always doing so many cool things, man. You know, um, I, I saw you were out in Sundance. Uh, mm-hmm. I saw you met the uh, a mutual friend of ours, Richard R. B. Botto. Yes, um, I mean that man is everywhere. I think he actually, Alex. I think he might do more networking than you do. Oh, no, there's no question RB does more networking uh, than I do. And RB is everywhere. He's in Cannes right now. He's in, like, I think in the Netherlands at the moment, according to his Instagram. Um, so he's, you know, he's everywhere all the time. Oh, absolutely. He does so much more networking than I do. I barely do any networking. I don't like networking. Uh, it's just not my thing. I network through podcasting. <laughs> That's how I network. I mean, I mean, you, you, but you see, you're such a likable guy. You've got this, you know, you, you're a hard, you got that hustle and grind, man. And I, and I think, you know, I, I would expect you to do a lot of, of networking. And was well, so, so let me ask you this: when you when you first went out to Hollywood, did you do the whole networking thing? Because I know you you lived in Miami till you were thirty, thirty three, thirty four, and mm-hmm. then you moved out to L A. When you got out there, did you start like hustling and grinding everywhere you could? Nah, like for me, it was just kind of like I. You know, when you get out here for the first time, it's, you know, you, the the streets are paved with gold. So, like, you just, like, walking around with your mouth open all the time, like, I can't believe I'm here. And uh, and that lasts for about two or three years, and then the cynicism set, sets in. Uh, <laughs> but um, – and you just become very cynical and angry. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, have I done the – yeah, I've done parties and stuff like that, and I've gone to networking things. But I don't do it often because I find that – they don't really do a whole lot, at least not for me. Um, people I meet at networking events generally are not, uh, you know, they don't help. 
Um, if anything, they're looking t- for you to help them. Uh, whereas in, if you go to a party or, or something like that, that's not a specific networking event, uh, that becomes a little bit better. Um, uh, but for me, it was, you know, I got here, I knew two people. And then slowly but surely, I just started putting my name out there and people started seeing my work and I started working. And then I started networking really through work, you know, people coming in and working with me as a colorist and editor uh, and post supervisor. And and then that's kind of how I network. And then I would go on a set and they're like, oh, here's our colorist. And then that's how I would meet people and stuff like that. So I networked through work as opposed to networking events. I, I just find that there just aren't really that useful but you know if you've got nothing else to do it's better than just sitting at home waiting for something to happen Uh, but that's just my experience yeah 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 very true i you know and i I found that way too and even when different guests are you know come on the podcast i always talk to them about you know different networking events so obviously some are much better than others um some hell are even put on by them uh you know and 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 the whole thing is is, you know runs the gamut i mean you know here i'm in philadelphia you know, you were in Miami before other guests have been in New York and then they've all gone to L.A. and they've gone to the networking parties there. So they have they have like a barometer to, to choose, you know, to say, OK, well, I went here and it was like this. And I go to L.A. and it was, you know, it was X, Y and Z. But I, I did find that as well, where a lot of the times people would just walk up to me and they would right away. Like, you know, uh, after I did Game Over, I had more people trying to be my friend. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Well, and the thing yep. was, I'm like, you know, I'm just some schlub who, who, you know, uh, who made something. And it's like everybody was messaging me. I had people just try, chopping at the bit. And I go, you know, I mean, God damn, like, talk to me like a human being first. I'm not like a, you know, like a vending machine. Not a piece, I'm not a piece of meat. <laughs> you know, I have fat feelings. <laughs> no, the thing is this. When you, when you actually create something in a small market – um, word gets around that like, oh, he's not a talker. He actually gets things done. And then all of the – everybody wants to be a, a, associated with you or work with you because you're actually getting things done. Because there's so many talkers. There's so many bullshitters out there, especially in the smaller markets like Miami and Philadelphia, that when you just make something and actually do what you said you were going to do, people will like start gravitating to you thinking that they're that you're going to be able to either help them uh, or they can suck off of you in some way, shape, or form, um, ride your coattails, if you will, which is hilarious because from your point of view, the coattail is there is no coattail. Uh, same thing happened to me when I you know, created a bunch of stuff in Miami. People started like coming around. I'm like, what do you, what, what do you, what, why? Go away. <laughs> like I can't help you. I can barely help myself. You know? <laughs> so like why are you and, – and, and things happen like that even now with Indie Film Hustle. I get – I get my favorite email of all time. I get, I got from some guy. Didn't say hello. Didn't say anything. It's like, help me with my film. That was the end of the email. Did, did you that help was, him with? Did you help him with, obviously, with his film? Obviously, I sent him a hundred thousand dollars, and now we're on our way to Sundance next year. No, Dave, I did not <laughs> help him at all. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yes, that was just. Uh, I was just like, wow. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's amazing some of the emails, man. Um, yeah, it, but like, you know, when people send stuff like that, I, I imagine they must do that to to. I imagine they have a email list, right? That they have like kind of like curated, and they must blast people constantly. I think you. I, I think you're. I think you're overestimating them. Really? I think they just like happen to be surfing the web, and like, oh, this guy is making movies. Let me email him. I think that I – mean, because if you're going to do that, then there should be a, a a standard stock email with like, hey, hello, how you doing? Those guys, yes. But the guy who goes, help me make my movie, that guy's not thinking really ahead of the game. <laughs> yeah, maybe I am giving them too much credit. I, <laughs> I, I, I always just imagine some people and – I, and, I, and I've actually – there was a guy I, I used to know here in Philadelphia like this. He, he had a, a, an email list of all these people – that like once a month he would tell them what he's up to like and he, and it wasn't like people who signed up for a newsletter or anything but what he did was he had a collection of these emails that he kind of got you know by hook or crook and right. he ended up you know and 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 finally people were like who the hell are you dude like why are you sending me oh, these yeah. emails it's, it's it's a desperation it's a desperate it's a desperate move and a de- and 
and I know that feeling because I was I was that I, w- I didn't do that specifically, but I was a very you know I was in that desperate energy mode where you would just run up to people and they can smell it and it's just not a good thing. You won't get anywhere. And here in L.A., you won't get any. I mean, you, you just they know they could smell you coming from a mile away. So th- when you start doing things like that, you seem desperate. You don't seem professional. You don't seem like you know what you're doing or that you have anything going on. And it actually it, 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 it backfires on you without question. Like that guy probably got nothing from that. If anything, he got a lot of hate and he probably got a lot of bad, bad energy and bad vibes towards him because he was doing that where he thought it was like, hey, I'm just going to let everybody know what I'm doing. Like, who? first of all, get out of your own ego and think that anyone gives a shit about what you're doing. You know, you've got to you got to change your atti- not only attitude, but your a- approach to it, you know, Um I'd let people know what I'm doing all the time, but I created a platform that allows me to provide value to my, to my audience. Uh, while doing that, I do promote my own things. I promote my own movies. I promote my own products, but I'm still always providing some sort of value to them. And, and, and that's a little bit different approach than help me make my movie. Oh, look, look how cool I am. Yeah. Yeah. You know, even with the email list, um, some people will. I'll, I'll send out my 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 weekly email, which is essentially just a podcast episode. Yes, and, and some people were like, you know, immediately somebody subscribed, and then I sent it out, and they immediately unsubscribed, or they would, or they would, they would get the email, and they would say like. How did you get my email address? I'm like, well, you, you signed up through my website. Like, I just, I, you know, come on here. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's just, it's just funny stuff like that. It, it, it's e- even when they do actually sign up. Sometimes, I mean, you've experienced this because you, even when people do sign up, sometimes they're, I, I don't know, maybe they're just surfing the web drunk, or they just don't know. There's that. Yeah, you know, they they just think they're getting something else. Mm. Um, it, you know, uh, it, it's just, it, you know, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is. Is when when you know you're trying to build an audience for whatever anything maybe a movie or or a podcast or what have you, um, it you have to be it, it's so unique now it's so different now that mm-hmm. it's so you know what I mean and and it's so like you know the old days of throwing up a website and calling it a day or or, or you know I mean oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those days are gone. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just you know, there's so many unique ways now you have to kind of market the movie. Uh, I, I mean, the the last time I, I think a movie mar- that movie marketing really stood out was probably Paranormal Activity. Um, not just for the fact that it cost thirteen thousand uh, dollars to initially make, it just the, the the whole concept and the marketing in general was just like you know I was like wow you know it's this guy literally did it. He literally just, you know, put a, 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 a camera in his room and his house, and he he just did it, man. But the the marketing of that movie, um, it wasn't done by him. Obviously, it was done by because that movie sat on a shelf for about eighteen months before it got picked up by Paramount. And I know the whole story about how you know he got into Paramount and uh, and that whole thing, and it turned into what it turned into. But uh, arguably, I think some of the best marketing I've ever seen in a movie is the Deadpool movies, uh, both of them, the first Deadpool and now this recent Deadpool. Uh, th- what they did, you could just see that the the uh, the inmates are running the asylum uh, with with those marketing campaigns. We're like, there's no way in hell a studio marketing team would have put out what they did. And I think on the second one, they've completely let them loose to do whatever the hell they want. It's very, very uh, wonderful marketing. I mean, some of the best marketing I've seen for a film ever, uh, honestly. Some of the really, really good stuff. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that is good, especially the second one. I like the trailer where he actually, you know, they show the uh, the, the visual effects before they're done. <laughs> yeah, kinda, you know, yeah, yeah you know, that, is, that, is, that is pretty well done. And um, – you know, it, it kind of reminds me you know, with Star Wars out right now. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm seeing you know all the new stuff now for Solo because we need a new Star Wars movie every year. Uh, the stuff's out for Solo, and I saw they had like limited edition cards. Only you could get, you could only get them at Denny's. And I'm sitting there going, I, I, get them. <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was gonna say like I, I don't see the tie-in between Denny's. Like when I think of Star Wars, I don't go Denny's. Oh, but look, I mean, I've got my I've got my Empire Strikes Back Burger King uh, glasses, you know, back in the day, you know, so there's no connection between Burger King and Star Wars. But back then, you know, you you did. <laughs> it's just the way it is. Oh, no, the, 
the connections between products are insane, man. Like, uh, what's that new one for um, Infinity? For Infinity War? Mm-hmm. <laughs> for Avengers? It's like, I was like, really? <laughs> you see a guy driving around with things blowing up around him, and it's like he's pretending he's in the Avengers? I don't know. But, hey, money's money, I guess, right? Yeah. There's there's a guy in the new uh, solo movie called Therm Scissor Punch. Genius. I go, man, they just don't give a fuck anymore. They're just throw they're just going for it. I, I honestly think that with this solo movie, I honestly think they were just shooting for the works. Uh and, I, and I'm interested gonna... to see what it does. I'm interested I'm I'm gonna go see it on Friday. I'm really interested to see what what happens with that movie. It it's it I'm just curious. Because I'm actually a Ron Howard fan. I'm a huge Ron Howard fan. I do love what he does. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to work with Solo, but the trailer looks great, but that doesn't mean anything. I'm curious. I'm curious to see how it does because it's – you know, I loved Rogue One. I thought Rogue One was amazing. Uh, I really enjoyed Rogue One. So I'm curious to see how these little Star Wars movies that are not part of the main trilogy uh, are going to do. And the next one I think is what? Boba Fett or Yoda or Obi-Wan? I, no one knows. <laughs> I, you know, Alex, honestly, man, after The Last Jedi, I'm like, never again. Really? You didn't like it, huh? These Those last three were brutal. You didn't uh, like For- Force Awakens either? Didn't like any of them. Uh, compa- uh, con- uh, honestly, I, you know, what, you know how, 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 much, how little I think of these? I mm-hmm. think that episodes one, two, and three look genius compared to them. All right, David, I think this is the end of this conversation. I think it was great talking to you and uh... – <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Alex, it's been great. Good night, everybody. It's been great. It's been great. Good night, everybody. Um, <coughs> we don't need to get into a, a Star Wars battle on this podcast. But with that said, I did see Phantom Menace the other day with my daughter for the first time in 20 years. And I cannot believe how horribly bad it was. It was so bad. So, so like, like Star Wars Holiday Special bad. That's how bad it was in my in my world. Other than the action sequences and the pod race is cool, um, and the Darth Maul stuff is cool. Other than that, it was just horrendously done. I mean, I can't believe that that was released. But I remember when I watched it, I said, "This is awesome." <laughs> when I saw it when it came out, I really like Force Awakens. I really like Rogue One. Uh, I am a fan of Last Jedi. And I think Last Jedi will age well. I don't like Empire. When Empire came out, people were ragging on Empire. Not to say that Empire and and Last Jedi are even in the same world, but I do think it'll age well. And I'm curious to see what they do with the third one uh, in this trilogy. But hey, look, after 20 years of no Star Wars and all of a sudden now we get one every year, you know, we'll see how long it lasts. I think we got at least another 10 years of this, at least. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. (coughs) You know, and just just to put a final thought on the whole Star Wars thing. You know, with with Darth Maul, he should have been the villain the entire couple of absolutely, movies. absolutely. I, I mean, that guy had so much potential. That's mm-hmm. why when he died at the end of Episode One, um, spoiler alert, spoiler. everyone, the, 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 the movie's <laughs> been out for like eighty years now. So, mm. <laughs> not our uh, fault. Yeah. So it, you know, it, it, I'm just like, that's it. You know, and I, and and here's here's my thought process on this, Alex. When I when I went and I saw Episodes Two and Three, uh, I thought. That somebody was going to pull the old switcheroo, and mm-hmm. I thought that General Grievous was going to be built from the remains of Darth Maul. That would have been nice. And then when it wasn't revealed that it, then then when he was killed by a blaster shot, I was like, oh, I guess the one, I guess that wasn't really meant to be. Maybe. What do you mean? Was... You mean Count Dooku wasn't as cool as Darth Maul? What? <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> Don't get me going, dude. Don't get me going. <laughs> I, I, I won't, Alex. I, I won't. <laughs> So you know, you know, Alex, you know, you you have a new movie out, um, mm-hmm. and I want to talk about that uh, on the corner of ego and desire. Uh, we'll talk about something better, Alex. I, I, I <laughs> so that's, yeah, <laughs> see, that's what I call. I'm sorry, that's a very subtle switch of the conversation. Very um, subtle. Yeah, you're good. Subtle, you, yeah. you've got talent. You. <laughs> that, <laughs> told you, man. I'm as subtle as a sledgehammer to a glass window pane, man. Yes, it's you like... are. Sir. Yes, you are. It's um, but no, just you know, I, I I'm very interested because you know you do a podcast, you 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 work you know on on all these movies full time, so 
you know, before we get into the movie, I just want to talk about you know what your normal day for you looks like because I'm I'm interested uh, because I I, I want to I mean I imagine you're like a productivity a productivity machine. So like, what do you do on a normal day, Alex? Can you take us through that? Well, right now, um, I wake up around five o'clock in the morning every day. I um did check my emails and stuff like that. I have a coffee or a, a yerba mate. I have a tea that I drink. Um. Then I will – right now, currently, I'm writing a book um, that uh, I will be announcing later on this year. Uh, so I write for about an hour. Um, then um, get my girls ready to go to school and then I I do – I try to meditate uh, at least an hour to two a day, believe it or not. Uh, it really helps me dramatically and ever since i've started doing it it, it my productivity goes up uh, tenfold because of it uh and then i'm just every day every day is a different task so like mondays are got to get my podcast ready cuz i do three podcasts a week um so i do most of those either on mondays or wednesdays uh and then the other days i'm doing interviews you know for my podcast and and just all, the, all throughout the day i'm just working on that kind of stuff when i'm in a movie mode um, like when I came back from Ego and Desire, it was a six week period there that I barely was able to get two podcasts out a week. Uh, and I was just doing post on, on the movie and, and, and dealing with the movie. So things change a little bit during that time. But, um, but I mean, I go to sleep early and I wake up early. Waking up early is the biggest thing I can suggest anyone could do. If you can wake up at four thirty, five o'clock every day, um, and go to bed like at nine thirty, and still get your seven hours of sleep. Uh, or six hours of sleep, you get a lot more done. Because the earlier you start working, the more productive. That those first few hours before six or seven are so much more productive because no one's bothering you. Nothing's coming in. No emails, no nothing. You could just really focus on doing that. Uh, and then at night I work sometimes too while I'm sitting there you know, watching TV. I'll pop, pump out an article or prep a, a podcast or something like that. Um, and I've got so many other things going on coming up that – if I tell you, you'll be like, well, are you out of your mind? But I am. So I have other, other, I have another podcast I'm launching soon. <laughs> other two podcasts I'm launching soon. So you're going to have four total? Yeah. Well, uh, those other two are going to be limited. So they're not going to be uh, every day, every week kind of thing. The only two I have right now are uh, the Indie Film Hustle podcast and the Bulletproof Screenplay podcast. Those are weekly and, and they are evergreen, so there's there's no seasons to that. The other ones will be a little bit more seasonal or limited edition versions, you know, things that I'll be doing as well coming up as uh, in the next few months, and um, and then just dealing with the marketing of uh, ego and desire as well, which is what I've kind of done this year. I I, I really wanted I got two other movies I want to shoot, like, but I decided to literally stop myself from shooting more movies this year. I was going to shoot another two. But I said, you know what? I'm going to focus on this book. I'm going to focus on um, marketing and, and, and putting energy towards ego and desire so it gives it the best shot it possibly can while as opposed to just like pumping out movies because I'm at a place where I can I can pump out movies fairly easily and very, fairly affordably. Um, whether they're good or not, we, we'll, I'll leave the audience to let me know. Um, but I have other ideas of stories that I want to do that I can do. In the model that I did, ego and desire, um, and and the model that I did, this is Megan. Yeah, I, I would love Alex. Uh, you know, uh, having seen you know, this is Meg, and uh, I, 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 I've seen the trailer. Obviously, I haven't seen on the corner of ego and desire yet, but I, I would love to see you work with a, a pretty significant budget because I, I think you are the exact type of indie filmmaker. That that you know what I mean that would thrive in that environment and and I and because I mean I don't think you'd want to work with the multi million dollar like you know Transformers budgets right not yet okay not yet not yet soon but not yet <laughs> <laughs> hey look you know if look if uh, if uh, Katie from uh, or Kathy from uh, Star Wars <laughs> from Lucasfilms <laughs> gives me a call uh, I'm 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 taking that meeting. <laughs> Ka Ka yeah, Kathleen Kennedy is going to be uh... yeah, Kathy. I I, I call her Kathy because <laughs> you know, um, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, or 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 Kevin Fahey gives me a holler. I'm I'm definitely showing up uh, to that meeting. 
Uh, but generally speaking, I do I do love the freedom and the and the and the swiftness of these kind of movies that I'm making right now, because of um, the exploratory way I'm making them. It, it, I I I really compare it to jazz, because it's kind of like you're just riffing, um, and it's a structured riffing, but it's still a riffing, and you're kind of discovering things along the way, um, and it's a really freeing way to make art. It's a wonderful way to make art. And, uh, and you can, you can do that at this budget level, you know, on a micro budget. Yeah. You know, you want to spend five grand, you want to spend 10 grand. Sure. That makes sense. You, you know, you can afford to lose that money. If you, if you can afford to lose it, then make it for that kind of money. But you know, if someone gives me a hundred grand, give me 200 grand. I'm there'll be elements of that, but it won't be as loose because then you have a respo- a physical responsibility to, uh, to return that money uh, and to make a profit. So there's a little bit of a different process. And then, and then when you start dealing in the studio world, that's a whole other world. Like now you're, you're, you're putting out a product. So now it's trying to maintain a creative intent while still putting out a product that will return, uh, make money. Cause you know, if you don't, you're done and, and, and you want to, you want to be able to keep making movies. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, uh, <laughs> I, 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 uh, I can't say the name of it, but I've actually had a friend of mine who was approached to make a, another film in a, in a kind of sort of popular uh, series of films. And uh, it ended up basically where everything kind of dissolved at the end. Like they were ready to go. Um, and then, you know, he had to make a lot of uh, artistic sacrifices, let's say. Sure, and, he finally, and he said, okay, you know, I'm still going to do it. And then they, at the end of all this, they said, we're going to go and we're, we're going to go in a whole nother direction with this. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was the end of it. And uh, but no, but like you know that that they were gonna. I mean, because he had never, he had never gonna. He was never. Go, he had never worked with that type of budget before. Um, basically, meaning that you know this was all gonna be, you know, this was the next level. Uh, you know what I mean? Sure. Like, we're, we're, you know, he was a, and he was approached about doing this. So mm-hmm. you know, it, it's just one of those things, man. But uh, hopefully, I can have him on the podcast when I did talk about it. But because it's actually pretty interesting. But uh, I, I know, it happens I, all. It happens yeah. all the time, and 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 you lose years off your life because yeah. you're you're playing this game where now i've gotten to that point in my life where i was like you know what unless it's a big thing like with real serious people i probably won't do it you know uh, because i don't have the time to waste uh, anymore in my life so uh, i'd rather just keep making my movies and do what i want to do and use the duplass brother kind of model you know the duplass models they actually went to the studio system they made two studio movies you know, under $10 million. And they said, you know what? This is not for us. We're going to actually pull back and go back towards the indie model of making movies for a couple hundred grand where we can actually make our money back and have complete creative control and enjoy ourselves. And that's what they've done. And, you know, they've been able to do TV shows and they have Netflix output deals now and all this kind of stuff. And that's the kind of model that I think I would probably want to go down with the possibility of doing more studio projects in the future. Um, until I get in there, I don't know what and how I will react to that environment. I would, I still would like to try it to see what happens. Uh, I have a feeling <laughs> of what's going to happen. Um, but it all depends on who you are as a, as an artist, as a director and, and what you're going to put up with and what kind of vision you want to put forward and all that kind of good stuff. But we'll see what happens in the future. You know, what's going to happen, Alex, you're going to blow up. You're going to, no, re- you're going to reach it. that next level. And you know what's going to happen then, Alex? Mm-hmm. You're going to turn around. And, and do the Dave Bullish show. And, and, no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, you're going to turn around, and <clears throat> riding on your coattails is going to be me. I am, I am going to be – I'm going to go, who is – what is that? What's that weight on my back? I keep, it's, it's heavy. It's kind of like a – it's a, it's a monkey on my back. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, it's just Bullis. Just, you know. Oh, it's Bullis again. Okay. We're making game over part two. Got it. Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there. Go. You know what? If you or Buff or McMahon or any of these guys, or any of you guys ever hit it big, I, I, I can promise you I will be there for you just to ride your coattails. You don't have to worry about any strangers. Just, just let old Bullis ride those coattails. And, uh, and, 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 I, and I will do the best I can to be the best yes man of all time. Fantastic, sir. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. Thank you. You're first in line, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm going to hold you to that, Alex. This is I know. Being rec- this, is being recorded. <laughs> this, is a, this is a legal con- a contract. Yes, I understand. 
<laughs> so you know, Alex, uh, you know, we were talking about all these other stuff that you've been doing—the writing the book, and 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 you know, you write during the day, because you because you write your own screenplays, and you know, you do the podcast and everything else. You know, when 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 you know when you're doing all these things and you're trying to be productive, mm-hmm. do you find the best way to be productive is to just to take your cell phone and just put it in another room that you're not in? Sometimes I do. When I write, I tur- I, I I just actually I, I put my uh, do not disturb on my phone and t- and flip it upside down. It's still next to me, but I don't. And things will come in, but I won't see it. I'll 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 turn off the the ma- the mail program so I don't hear any emails come in. And then I'm just I'm just rocking and rolling, so that's the way I kind of disconnect. Um, when I when I do that, it does help because I found that the, if I leave the email on, it's it just won't work. Um, you just kind of set aside that kind of stuff, and and if you're gonna be productive, you know, set aside an hour to write. Just set aside an hour to write, and that's all you're gonna do for that hour is write. And um, you know, and and, and and that seems to work for me very very well. If you're constantly being interrupted, that's why I say waking up early in the morning is great because you literally – no one's bothering you. Uh, Robert Rodriguez, uh, when he edits his movies, he did at least, he would actually start editing at 6 p.m. and then go to bed at 6 a.m. So he basically send his kids to school and he just go to bed. So he switched his ca- calendar around because that way he could edit all night and would not get disturbed because no one calls you at 1 o'clock in the morning. So he that he says that was the only way he found that he could get things done because people were constantly bothering him, constantly calling him to, you know, for all the things that he runs in his empire. So he's just like when he's editing, he just disconnects that way and lets other people deal with his other stuff that he has to deal with. So it is really helpful to to, to wake up early. But, yeah, I would agree with you to just disconnect everything else. And uh, that way you'll be a lot more productive. Yeah, I've uh, I've started waking up early. And not not even just for my job, but in general, I, I've noticed that when I wake up early, um, I kind of sort of can avoid a lot of the bum rush. I can't always avoid it, mm-hmm. um, but um, most of the time, I if you can believe it or not, I, I get emails from my day job a lot of the time, like very early in the morning, and uh, I have to answer them at the time they come in. So sometimes I can avoid it, sometimes I can't. Um, but but yeah, I, I've noticed that you know if you can just have time to yourself. And set aside this this time and say this is going to be my time no matter what, um, and just try to shut everything out. Mm-hmm. That's the way to be be the most productive is, is to do something like that and just get in get, get it in anywhere you can because even sometimes when I have like ten minutes I try to be as productive as possible. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Anytime I'm, I'm anytime I go anywhere, I have either a podcast running, I have audiobooks running on my phone, so I'm listening constantly, educating myself. I'm in a car in a commute. Podcasts and audiobooks are my best friends, uh, and you know I've got like stacks of audiobooks waiting <laughs> for me to uh, to listen to. I'm constantly listening to books everywhere I go, so I actually look forward to commutes sometimes, or, or if I have to go to the other side of the the hill here in L.A., which is basically like going to another country. Uh, that's an hour, uh, you know, drive. So if that's an hour drive, I'm like, okay, great, I get to get an hour in, in my book that I'm reading right now. So that's something else I would definitely advise anybody, you know, turn your commute into uh, a university. Anytime you're sitting in line, shopping, you know, supermarket, have have a podcast going or have a um a audio book going so you're educating yourself and moving yourself forward. So so what podcast do you listen to? Uh well obviously the Indie Film Hustle podcast. Um the uh, the Bulletproof Screenplay podcast. Um <laughs> two, two great choices, Alex. <laughs> no, um I, I like Tim Ferriss, I like Gary V. Uh I like Pat Flynn. Um because I'm more into the the, on, the online business kind of world stuff. Uh and then on the film side I listen to your podcast. Uh when Scott does a podcast, his lazy mother. Um <laughs> I listen to his podcast. Uh, I also listen to John August uh, is another good one uh, on the screenwriting side. Um, Jerry Goldsmith, uh, the Q and A. Oh God, what else do I listen to? Um, and a lot of audiobooks, man. Just tons and tons of audiobooks. I've got so many right now. I'm on an audiobook kick. I got like I, I got. I'm not shooting you. Probably about ten books that I'm going through right now, and they're all unabridged. <laughs> so it like takes forever to listen through them all. 
You know what one I actually just downloaded uh, just yeah. because I, I, I it seemed to intrigue me. It was the uh, it's the audio book of I'll Be Gone in the Dark. No, oh, cool. How is that? It, it's really great so far. It's it, you know it's uh, for those listening who aren't too aware of what the book's about. It's um it, it's about a a I guess amateur sleuth who who basically investigated the Golden State Killer, and uh, she actually passed away. And then unfortunately, and then and then the book got uh, published post. Uh, um, what is that post uh, post mortem post mortem yeah and um, and then then now they actually caught the killer um, and then it, which I, I mean everyone knows that it's, it was all over the news that well they think they caught the killer actually it's allegedly um, and then now the the book is going to be made into a TV series and because <laughs> you know because Alex you know that's the bread and butter man it's not a movie anymore it's a TV series no it's a series you're going to make much more money with series than you are with a movie no yeah. absolutely. So and, and it actually would make an interesting series if it's done right, uh, which it probably will be because it's HBO doing it. I think mm-hmm. so. So you know it's going to be a, a home run shot. But um, it, another book, it, another book I would recommend that I just I, I'm in the middle of right now is Like Brothers, which is the Mark Duplass and Jay Duplass book that just got released. They that that tells their whole story of how they went from a three dollar short film that got into Sundance to where they are now with Netflix shows and HBO shows and things like that. So it's a wonderful story, uh, inspirational story and, you know, like a kind of roadmap of how they did it. Uh, and it's something that you could do today. A $3 short film that got into Sundance. Is that still possible? Uh, I don't know if a $3, you know what? Yes, it is. It is. If there's a story there and that was what they proved because in 2004, when they got their movie this is john which is basically seven minute short film about a guy named john trying to put um a outgoing message on his answering machine on and then he has literally a mental breakdown uh because his life sucks so bad um which is based on jay duplass because that happened to him a few days earlier uh, they shot that and it got in and they said, look, it was the worst looking thing ever to get into Sundance it is the worst sounding thing ever to get into Sundance. And there was but there was something there. There was a a magic, a special sauce, as they put it. And it's a great term. If you can find that special sauce, people will forgive the production value and even the audio. If the story is riveting, if the story grab grabs you. It can win. So I do believe a $3 short film can do it, but it has to be special. Could that $3 short film do it today? Probably not. It's a different world than we are in 2005 than it is now. But could a, could a story do that? Yes. I do believe it. it is possible. You know, I, I still want to believe that it is possible. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, I, I think that's the whole spirit of, of Sundance and Slam Dance and and, 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 you know, because there really is just two models of, of in the feature world anymore. You're either making a tentpole movie or you're making an indie film. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You're making a movie that's under $5 million. Um, or you're making – there's a couple of, of tiers there. You know, you got the $5 million and below. You've got the $1 million and below, half million and below. And then, you know, I, I hear people saying, oh, I made a micro-budget film. It was $150,000. I'm like, go fuck yourself. Like, are you kidding me? One hundred fifty thousand dollars? I can make three movies with that, four movies with that, five movies with that. You know, like that's not a micro budget. Micro budget for me is like forty, fifty grand and below. You know, and even then, micro budget actually is probably less than that because you know when people hear my budgets, they're like, "What?" <laughs> they're like, "How much did you make that for?" You know, so. But, you know, it, it's doable and uh, well, we could have a conversation about how it's doable. But but yeah. And then if not, it's not that then it's a temple. It's it's 80 million dollars or above. There's no middle ground anymore, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and you know, you mentioned making. Uh, you, uh, b- by the way, everyone listening, Alex is actually sick at the moment. So. So, yeah, that's why I'm <laughs> coughing. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> he's actually, you know, uh, he's not trying to get out of the interview. or anything. <laughs> no, like, I'm actually I'm actually got a little sick cough. So I apologize for the coughing, guys. No, it'd be funny if you were like, I can't do it, Dave. <laughs> I, can't, I can't. I'm so. No, Dave, I... this interview is really going well, but I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of girls have used that with me in high school, my friend. It doesn't work anymore. No, I know. I know. Okay. <laughs> but, um, but uh, you know, you, you you mentioned making a few movies for you know uh, that that hundred fifty thousand. Uh, I want to talk about ego and desire on the yeah. corner of ego and desire. 
it, it, just from the trailer, I, I like this concept um, for a couple of reasons. Um, but before I get into that, uh, could you just give us, you know, for everyone listening, could you just give us a, a quick, you know, synopsis of, of the film? Yes. Uh, ego and desire. Hold on a second. I'm going to actually read you the desire. It's because I, I, my, my synopsis that I wrote is so much better than what I'm just going to spew out right now. So I'll just read it to you. Uh, three hapless independent filmmakers make the trek to the Sundance Film Festival and go through absolute hell in search of an elusive producer that is supposedly going to buy their independent film all within 24 hours. With a producer that stole money from his mother's retirement account to fund the film, to a director that thinks she's the next Francis Truffaut, to an actor slash editor who is a doormat for everyone, this motley crew is of misfit filmmakers have a tough time navigating the chaotic world of the Sundance Film Festival. Ignorance, foolishness, and above all, ego – drive the team to implosion as they struggle to realize their filmmaking dreams. Yeah, I, I, I like that. No, I, I like that, Alex, because th- there's a few reasons why. And th- one of the reasons is it's it speaks to a lot of filmmakers who, mm-hmm. especially the second part, the second the director who thinks she's the next true foe. Um, <laughs> I think we've all met somebody like that. Um, or I want- are that person or are that person. <laughs> <laughs> If I ever get to be that bad, I, I hope somebody just beats the he- holy hell out of me. I, you know what? I think all of us have um, – uh, we all have to have a little bit of that in us. Uh, I think when oh, you're yeah, younger, yeah. I think when you're younger, it's just so much more. Um, like when I was in my 20s, my ego was out of fucking control, like completely ridiculous. I never got to the point where my main character in the movie is where she is just completely gone, <laughs> like completely gone. Uh, but yeah, I think we, and the funny thing is, is a lot of people who have seen the movie uh, in the industry, they turn to me and they say, oh, I know that girl. I'm like, oh, you know the actress? Like, no, I know that person. <laughs> I've worked with that person. I'm like, oh shit, really? Like, yes, I've worked with people like that. I was like, and I can't believe how many people told me that. Kind of, was, it was a little surprising actually. <laughs> Yeah, it, I, I actually had a friend, um, well, ex friend who was kind of like that. He got a modicum of success, mm-hmm. and uh, he started going around calling himself the new Quentin Tarantino. Sure, of course. And, and uh, I mean, his ego was was bigger than I. I have never met a person change so freaking quickly. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting there going, "Oh, well, okay, man." And um, he crashed and burned, and. Um, now I, I he he you know he and I haven't spoken in years, and the last I heard he was shooting um, something some some weird web series in the middle of nowhere because he's living in the middle of nowhere right now and uh, and the only reason I know that is because I have a, we have a mutual friend who just took a photo of him on set and I'm like yep that's exactly what I thought he would be. Mm-hmm. Hey, look, it happens for everybody. You know when you have a little bit of success. Um, it, it, how you handle it as a whole, and, and and that takes that takes you know experience, years uh, of of living life to kind of deal with it. Uh, like uh, uh, um, one of my main characters in this is Meg, who was a who was a guru. He actually gave a really good piece of advice, even though he was joking, but it was great. It was when you're young, uh, you are like a seed in a bucket, and when you know, and when uh. Fame comes along. Fame is a bucket of water that gets come in, you know, thrown on top of you. And if you're just like this little seed, you just get swashed all over the place. You have no, you're you're just taken for the ride. And if you're older, those roots are settled in, and they've actually gone in, and they're deep into the soil. So when that same amount of fame comes on you, you're grounded, and you can't, and you don't get moved around as much. But that takes time. And I thought that was a great analogy. Yeah, it, it is, and uh, you know, I know you and I have talked about this, about this before, but overnight with Troy Duffy, oh, where, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a prerequisite for every independent filmmaker to watch that, yeah. that documentary. Yeah, it, it's, uh, and I actually, uh, I like who I actually had a friend of mine interview him, and he said, "Yeah, it's pretty true to life," and uh, like, like that's exactly how he was. Like, he didn't learn his lesson after that, um, so. Some people, know. some people don't learn their lesson. The, you know, some people do, some people don't. Um, but it is what it is. What are you going to do? <laughs> Everyone's got their journey. That, that's true, Alex. And I promise you this: if I ever get any anywhere of modicum of fame or fortune, uh, it's going to go to my head in record time. Oh, it's I gonna... know that. I know you're going to. You will implode with hookers and cocaine around you when you die. You're going to go John Belushi style. I got you. I got you. 
I, I the ride there though, Alex, is going to be insane. I'm going to be I'm quick. Gonna... It'll be quick, but it's going to be fun. <laughs> oh, it's going to yeah, exactly. It's going to be it's going to be like that ride at the park, man. It a lot of twists and turns, and it's over before you know it. But you're like, damn, that was fucking thrilling. It was just it was. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be like, "Hey, Dave, remember, you know, remember me? It's Alex Ferrari." I'll be like, "I'm sorry, I don't know who you are. I don't know. I have no idea who you are." I'm like, <laughs> "All right, fine." <laughs> that's what that's what you call big timing somebody. You yes, go, exactly. you, you walk by them. Like I would walk by you, and I wouldn't say hello or anything. You, you got a big time. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> You know, Alex. You know, you and I have never actually met, and, and no. you know, it, it's funny because I, I think if you and I ever even met or even worked on a project together, mm-hmm. I, I think the the amount of like energy from our our adrenal glands could like power Vegas for a couple of years. But easily, easily, <laughs> easily without question, without question. Oh, uh, but uh, but you know, just getting back to you know, in the corner of ego and desire. So you mm-hmm. actually shot the film at Sundance. Yeah, I had the idea to shoot the movie uh, in October of last year um, where I had a, f- a buddy of mine who has a condo on Main Street where we we're going to stay. And I just turned to him. I said, you know, I think it, it'd be irresponsible of us not to shoot a movie this year at Sundance. <laughs> and he's like, continue. And, uh, and you know, we kind of came up with this, the idea of, you know, let's, let's, let's have some filmmakers try to sell a movie at Sundance. We've never seen that before. Uh, no one's ever shot a feature film at Sundance, a narrative feature film at Sundance. So that's one. Two, I've never seen anyone try to sell a movie on uh, in a movie. Like if it's always about making a movie or writing a script, but no one ever made a movie about trying to sell a movie because generally that's not a really exciting part of movie making. But I was able to make it exciting because of their ignorance of what Sundance is and using Sundance as the backdrop. Um, and I decided to kind of make a love letter to not only Park City uh, and and the and, and the festival that you know made Park City famous, but also to kind of do like a spinal tap for independent filmmakers. I think it's something that needs to be sat- satirized. And you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been in the business for over twenty years, uh, and I have a lot of experience in seeing other filmmakers go through their journeys and my own personal journey. And I was like, I've never seen this on screen before. Let's do this. Let's let's find it. And then luckily enough, I also found an amazing actress, Sonia O'Hara, that that I said, you know what? I want her to be the director because I've never seen a female director on screen in any movie about making movies. It's never I've never seen it. It's always a dude. So I was like and she was like, oh, my God, finally, I, I could see a woman director being the douche. <laughs> like she said that to me. I was like, that's awesome. She's like, yeah, I could be the complete ass. This is going to be great. And my other cast, uh, Rob, uh, Alicia, and uh, Randy Stamos Jr., uh, they rounded out the cast, and these guys were like uh, the Wizard of Oz. They were going, trying to find, uh, trying to find Oz, going through, um, through Sundance. So you've got the inexperience of trying to sell a movie, um, their ignorance, their ego uh, to the whole process, and then – Sundance, which is a behemoth of, of just going to Sundance, uh, is physically uh, – people don't talk about what happens to you physically. You know, you will – it will beat you down. Like, it, you know, it's, it is a physically draining time because of the altitude if you're not used to it, because of the hiking up and down. Uh, the cold weather is brutal. Um, you know, not being able to get into places, not being able – you know – they lose the place where they live um, for the night or they're, they're staying. There's just so many things that happen to them along the way. So I was like, I want this to be kind of like a love letter to to Park City and to Sundance through my experiences, through Adam, who's the co-producer, is experienced, who's been at the festival 20 times. I've been there six. And, you know, so we know the, the whole layout pretty much inside out, uh, even even capping it off with a official Sundance party that they weasel their way into. You know, uh, you know, this huge party that we actually throw every year. So it, it, it was a real wonderful experience. We shot the movie in approximately four days um, and it was just three three crew members. It was myself, um, Austin, my my DP cameraman, my sound guy, Kyle. And then I had a friend of mine, Straw, who who um, who came around and was kind of like our first AD UPM. That's it. And we just ran around and did. We shot everywhere, anywhere we wanted. We even shot 
in Sundance headquarters. We shot two scenes at Sundance headquarters. You know, we're like, we're in the belly of the beast. And I really didn't realize how crazy this whole process was until like day three when I was watching some behind the scene footage of a scene that we shot on Main Street with like 500 people around us. I'm like, oh my God, we're fucking nuts. Uh, This is crazy. So, you know, I wrote a scriptment for the movie. So it was a very structured uh, outline like I did with Meg. And then we improv along the way. <clears throat> and I would feed uh, ideas to the actors because a lot of the stuff that we were talking about, especially the pretentious stuff, I would throw the movies and like, you know, watching Yojimbo. Kurosawa's was Yojimbo on Laserdisc. <laughs> you know, things like just the most pretentious stuff you could think of. Um and, and and threw a lot of that stuff out at them, but they came up with some amazing things as well. Everybody did. It was a big collaboration. And, you know, at the end of the whole thing, I was like, I don't even know if I have what we have. And when I got back, it was I had the whole thing edited, colored, uh, and sound within six weeks. So it, from shooting it to out to final output, I was done in six weeks because I was rushing to get to a a, a, a festival submission. And uh, that was the process. So it was uh, easily the most wonderful experience I ever had as a director. It was just so wonderful. I don't even remember doing it. It was so quick. It's like a dream. It, it's it literally was a dream. But like you talk to a lot a lot on your show about this, and so do I about creating a product for an audience. Well, my audience is filmmakers. You know, at Indie Film Hustle. So I literally built this product. It cannot be more custom built to the niche audience that I am aiming it at, which is independent filmmakers around the world who not only want to see a funny movie about filmmaking, hopefully it's it's a little bit educational to show you what not to do, but also if you've never been to Sundance, this movie will give you the Sundance experience. When you're done, you will feel like you've gone through Sundance because we do everything you would do at Sundance. We hit every major point or a part of, of Sundance and even slam dance. We shot a little bit up at slam dance as well. So it was a, it was a really amazing experience and I can't wait for the world to see it. I, I, I for a second, I thought you were going to say you bumped into like Robert Redford or something. And he was like, he was kind of like, who the hell are you? No, you know, I thought, you know, my theory was this man. I was like, you know what? There's going to be so many cameras around that no one's going to notice us. We shot the thing on, by the way, on the black magic pocket camera. So we shot the little on a little camera with you know really cool lenses, vintage lenses that we had, and so we had a small footprint. But once I got there, I realized I could have busted out on Alexa, and no one would have given a shit. There's just so many cameras, so many things going on that no, every everyone's just like, oh, they're just shooting. And anyone asked me anything, I'm like, yeah, we're shooting something for YouTube, and that's it. Because no one in their right mind would think that we're shooting a movie. Like, who's crazy enough to do something like that? <laughs> that's I'm, just ta- nuts. I'm talking to the man who's crazy enough to do that's, that. That's that's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you got you know, look. Sometimes you just gotta roll with it, man. You know, people were asking me, like, well, how about all the extras? Did you get releases? Did you get permits? I'm like, <laughs> permits. <laughs> you just ran around and shot. Like, no one has permits to shoot when you're at Sundance. You just shoot. You know, just go around and shoot. And and if everyone's outside, they're in a public area. You know, they, they there's no expectation of um. Of privacy. So, you know, if someone spoke, we got their permission in the movie. But other than that, I got thousands of extras, amazing amount of production value um, by running around and doing this movie. But at the end of the day, it is still a a love letter to filmmakers, to the independent filmmakers, to Sundance, to Park City. Um, and it's done with a lot of love. And I think in people who've seen it, uh, especially only people – I think mostly people in the industry have seen this movie so far. Uh, they all just love it because it's just – it's it's built for them, you know, and, and they get the jokes and they get all the inside stuff. But I think it's a movie that could find a, a larger audience later because of the universal theme of going for your dream and it being ripped away from you, literally ripped away from you at the last moment and how brutal that is and what you need to continue to do if you want to keep going down the path because you know well you know as well as I do that following this dream of being filmmakers being storytellers like this it's not easy and you constantly have to keep going and you're going to get 
a thousand no's before you get one yes. Um, and you can't quit on no number 998. You got to keep going, you know. Uh, and I've had a lot of experiences where I got so close, you know, and, and you'll read about it soon. Um, but you get so close to your dream and it's ripped from you. Um, and I think the backdrop of Sundance is a perfect backdrop for that kind of story. Yeah, it, it really is. And, you know, it, it just speaks to the independent spirit of – or the independent idea of, hey, I want to – I know how <laughs> I can get our movie into Sundance. You know, it's like Brew Breaker and I talked about before where you know that was that was the model for some people where it's like, hey, look, we're going to make this movie. We're going to sell it to Sundance for, uh, you know, a, a, a million dollars and then we're all just going to go on from there. That's a distribution idea. Yeah, that's a distribution yep, yep. plan. It's like make a movie and submit it to Sundance. I'm like, that's not a distribution plan, guys. Uh, and, and the thing is, too, this is not a movie about make, getting into Sundance. It's about following this producer, that the, hunting down this producer that said that they were going to look at their movie. It has it, The Sundance is a backdrop. It's not even about trying to break into Sundance. It's not trying to get into Sundance. Sundance is a backdrop of this, this uh, the story unfolding. But – you know, Sundance to many filmmakers around the world, I would argue to most, is the ultimate, uh, the ultimate goal. Like to get into the Sundance Film Festival means everything to a lot of filmmakers and around the world. It's like the ultimate thing, and I'm I'm one of them. I would love to, I would love this movie. You know, it would be the most meta thing in the world for this movie to get into Sundance and play at the Egyptian theater. So when my characters are looking at the Egyptian theater from outside. While we're playing inside, it's just your mind is blown. <laughs> yeah, you know, and and that's the the funny part of it is too is when it, when I, we're talking about the, the, that distribution plan, you know, it, it's like how many of that have actually worked. You know what I mean? Like how many times have have you know the movie been made, you know, verbally through contracts or whatever, where everyone's working, you know, uh, uh, per diem or whatever, and all of a sudden you realize, you know, this movie's not going anywhere. Most. Yeah, you know it's funny. It, it, the funny part was there was a uh, a meme uh, that uh, you know uh, Calvin uh, Vanderbeek uh, put up. You know, girl, a producer, at girl, mm -hmm. producer, mm -hmm. and it was like you know that that face you make when some new director says he knows somebody who can get our film into Sundance. And oh, like, God. Uh huh. Jesus. <laughs> Nobody. Look, I actually know people who know people at Sundance. Like I know. I have a direct contact to like the guys who run Sundance. It means nothing, nothing. It does means nothing unless you're a big name or have some big stars in your movie. It really doesn't mean a whole hell of a lot. Honestly, it just yeah. doesn't because that's not the way they play. You know, just because they get the movie in front of the, per the people doesn't mean it's going to get picked. I mean, yeah. unless you are a studio, unless you've got big titles or you've been there before, like if the Duplass brothers call, they're going to watch whatever the Duplass brothers say to watch because they are the Duplass brothers now, you know, and, and, and things like that. But other than that, it, you know, for, for lowly commoners like ourselves, it's not easy to get in. Amen to that, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, where can people uh, check out on the corner of Ego and Desire? Uh, just head over to uh, egoanddesirefilm.com and you can check the trailer out and I'll have – behind the scenes pictures, everything that needs anything about the movie will be there. Eventually right now we just got the trailer uh, synopsis and a few behind the scenes pictures of how we shot it. Uh, but there's going to be a new trailer coming out in the next uh, few weeks. Hopefully um, there'll be more of a story trailer. This is a teaser trailer that I have up right now. And we uh, we've submitted to a handful of festivals. So as soon as we have some festival screenings, uh, then you're going to see a lot more of ego and desire all over the place. I'm going to promote the living hell out of it. Um, and then of course you can find me at IndieFilmHustle.com, which is, uh, the main hub for everything I do, uh, in the indie film world. And I'm going to link to that everyone in the show notes at DaveBullis.com. Uh, before we leave though, Alex, I have one yeah. final question for you. Yeah. Is there, uh, is there anything you would like to say to, that to put a period at the end of this whole conversation? You're, you're full of great knowledge, uh, Alex. And I, <laughs> and I just want to say, is there anything? So, so the question is, do you, is there anything you want to say to sort of surmise everything we talked about? I mean, I think the one thing I would love to put out there is that uh, I know I, I know a lot of filmmakers listen to this, epi this these shows uh, and to your podcast. I think that you've got if you're if you're listening and you're and you're on your commute somewhere um, or you're working out or wherever you are listening to this, 
understand that you need to get out of your own way and you have to just go out and do it. It's never going to be perfect. It's never all the things are not going to align exactly the way you want to do it. You've got to get out and do it because the second you do something, you've set yourself apart of 99% of everybody else in this industry that talks shit. And if you're the one out there that's actually making stuff, go out there and do it. You don't need a whole lot of stuff to go out there and do it. I shot this movie with a small $1,000 camera, a couple of lenses that you could either rent or buy. I had an, I found an audio guy and I got a bunch of actors and ran around and made a movie. It's, do- it's doable. And if I'm able to do it in the insane world of the Sundance Film Festival, uh, you guys can definitely go around your town, wherever you are, write the story around things you have access to. You know, the Duplass brothers did that. Robert Rodriguez did that. It is, is, is tried old tradition of independent filmmaking. Take inventory of what you have. Go out and, and, and write something around that and do it, man. Just go out and do it and, it, and don't expect it. Don't attach uh, an outcome to it. Just do it for the sake of doing it and see what happens. Do it for very low money. Do it for a thousand bucks. Do it for five thousand bucks. Don't go crazy in your first one. Just do it, and you'll you'll be amazed at what happens. You know, my first little film that I made with called This Is Meg, that one went on to sell to Hulu, and I sold it internationally, and I shot it with a bunch of friends in their houses. You know, so it's doable. Just go out and do it, and grow from there. But get out of your own way, because I think that's the biggest mistake I did is I kept waiting for everything to be perfect and and I kept getting in my own way and making excuses. And a lot of times those excuses were because I was scared to do it until I finally said, you know what's enough's enough. I gotta go out and make it happen, man. Cause I'm not getting any old I'm not getting any younger. So and that's what happened and, and my whole life changed after that. So if I can do it, if Sean Baker can do it with Tangerine, if the Duplass brothers could do it with a three dollar short film or puffy chair and the list goes on and on. There's no reason why you guys can't do it, too. Alex Ferrari, that's a hell of a way to end it, my friend. Uh, I want to say thank you so much for coming on. And everybody, everything that Alex and I talked about will be in the show notes at DaveBullis.com. And you can stalk. I'm going to put all of Alex's stuff in there, too, so you could stalk him. Um, hmm. Feel free to pitch him. Send your movie scripts. Everything. No, 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 no. <laughs> Stop that, Bullis. Stop send, it. Send him an email. It just says, uh, make my movie now. And then, uh, movie now, and then I forward them over to Dave. <laughs> and they'll be they'll be in real trouble then. I'll be like, uh, all right. Uh. Dave, thanks for having me on, brother. I appreciate it. It's always a pleasure talking to you, man. No, no, no. It's, my pleasure's all mine, man. Like I told you that, that, that funny story. Some people were like, you know, you and Alex are friends, right? And I said, yeah, yeah. They're like, is he really a, a good guy? And I'm like, oh, he sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, trust I, me. And vice versa, sir. I say the exact same thing. <laughs> Ever since no. that one episode where where you said how not to shoot a pilot, uh, <laughs> how not to shoot a movie or a TV show, uh, that episode we did together, which, by the way, is done very well. Um, people always ask me, is that really what happened? I'm like, yeah, it's Dave. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, every word of that is 100% true. I will swear on any six-pack of Bibles or whatever holy book. I, every word of that was true. Um, I am so proud of that episode, by the way. And I actually had people who I know listened to that, and they were like, "Jesus Christ!" And I said that that was the tip of the iceberg. Like if you if you, I could have I could have talked for another two hours of all the twists and turns, and I've had people who are listeners on your show actually message me and say, "You know, it takes balls to do that." Yeah. And I said I, I said honestly, I I, I you know I, I just hope that somebody gains something from that, where you know no matter what, and I I get into fights with people about this all the time. I don't care who they are, they have to have a contract on the on to come on the set in some way, shape, or form because that's what started all this. Mm-hmm. But with 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 game over, and because it slowly got momentum, and oh shit, it's actually going to be worth something. And then then all those twists and turns. I mean, we had funding, we didn't have funding. I'm going to link to that everyone in the show notes that episode. I I am so happy that episode. Um, I you know, and and it, I'm so glad it's doing well, Alex. Uh, hopefully, it, it keeps it, doing well. It's, it's been downloaded thousands and thousands of times already, and and I think uh, you were on the corner of ego and desire during that process. I think. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I, I was. Uh, I, 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 I will say I was always a good guy to work with. I'm always, I'm always trying to be at least somewhat nice to people. Not that second day, though. On that Saturday, I think I was probably uh, – well, everyone was miserable that day. But, uh, <laughs> but, that, but that's, all, that's another story. But I'm going to link to all that in the show notes, everybody. Uh, again, Alex, thank you so much, brother. Thank you, brother. Find Dave at DaveBullis.com. Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.